President-elect Trump is lashing out at the United Nations four days after the Security Council voted to condemn Israeli settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Former U.N. Ambassador John Bolton is among our guests tonight. He calls it President Obama's parting betrayal of Israel. Also, a historic visit. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe visiting the Pearl Harbor Memorial with President Obama to pray but not apologize. We'll have the latest. And who are these people? Shopping malls nationwide in chaos as brawls break out among shoppers. We'll have a full report. And good evening, everybody. I'm Tom Sullivan in for Lou Dobbs. And we begin with a historic meeting at Pearl Harbor. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is not the first Japanese leader to visit Pearl Harbor since the 1941 bombing, but Abe is doing something unprecedented, and that is publicly acknowledging Japan's past aggression. Fox News correspondent Kevin Cork is traveling with the president in Hawaii, and he has this report. It was a day for reflection and reconciliation, but not for an apology. As the prime minister of Japan, I offer my sincere and everlasting condolences to the souls of those who lost their lives here. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe today acknowledged Japan's role in the deadly attacks on Pearl Harbor 75 years ago this month at the memorial site of the USS Arizona, but he stopped short of apologizing. Instead, Abe struck a tone similar to that of President Obama, who spoke at Hiroshima earlier this year. And while the sounds of battle have long since faded, some vestiges of the war do remain. Most notably, the security relationship that effectively calls on the United States to assume the role of protector of the Japanese Empire, a role that comes at a very heavy cost to the American taxpayer, both in terms of manpower and money, something that then-candidate Donald Trump called unsustainable. I want Japan and Germany and Saudi Arabia and South Korea and many of the NATO sta nations they owe us tremendous. We're, we're taking care of all these people. And what I want them to do is pay up. Analysts believe Trump's comments have created a level of uncertainty among leaders in Tokyo, who, like Abe, have long dealt with the complicated internal politics of America's military presence in Okinawa. But while Trump's suggestion that Japan assume more of the burden for its defense would be a departure from existing U.S. policy, experts doubt the rhetoric will alter reality. Um, they have common interests. They have common values. And they are threatened by a country that has challenged both Tokyo and Washington, and that, of course, is China. And I think that will be an important uh, element of the glue that keeps these two nations marching forward together. Still, it was Abe who was the first world leader to greet Mr. Trump after his victory in November, a sign that even if the dynamics change, the relationship, one of America's most important, will endure. Importantly, and perhaps most poignantly, the president today recognized veterans of World War II, many of whom were right here in the audience, the greatest generation who served so bravely that fateful day, a day they'll never forget, and a generation that we'll never forget. Tom? I'll never forget. Thank you, Kevin Cork. Meantime, growing fallout tonight over a United Nations resolution declaring Israeli settlements illegal. Secretary of State John Kerry is set to address the Middle East uh, peace process tomorrow. His speech comes as Israel accuses the Obama administration of orchestrating the vote. We have rather uh, ironclad information uh, from sources in both the Arab world and internationally uh, that this was a, a deliberate push by the United States. And in fact, they helped uh, create the uh, resolution in the first place. Why Israel already is uh, reducing ties with countries who supported the anti-Israeli resolution, which uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called a, quote, shameful ambush. President-elect Trump slamming the United Nations over the vote, tweeting, and I quote, the United Nations has such great potential, but right now it is just a club for people to get together, talk, uh, have a good time. So sad. About a quarter of the U.N. budget, about $3 billion, comes from the U.S. annually. Well, joining me now, former U.S. ambassador to the U.N. and American Enterprise Institute senior fellow uh, John Bolton. Mr. Ambassador, what's your, what's your reaction to? I mean, you, that's where you hung your hat for a number of years. Is it just a place to get together and talk and have fun? 
Well, I had fun when I was there defending American interests. Uh, probably not other people didn't have so much fun. But look, uh, th this was a clear abuse uh, of the uh, of the UN to disadvantage Israel. The Obama administration's abstention on this resolution uh, is a repudiation of 50 years of bipartisan American Middle East policy. Uh, it steps in to try and tilt the scales in favor of the Palestinians as against Israel. Uh, and it rejects uh, this 50-year-old uh, doctrine called land for peace, which is that Israel gives back the territories that it won in wars that were uh, that are directed against it, and in exchange it gets peace. So I, I just can't think of a, a worse way for the Obama administration to go out. It's going to be a significant resolution. I think the Trump administration is going to have to work hard to mitigate or reverse its consequences. Uh, it's just a needless tragedy and reflects, I think, Obama's basic ideology. Well, I don't, I don't expect you to understand why he did this. Uh, you can't read his mind, but it, it just seems odd that usually at the end of your administration you kind of go out gracefully what what this does set up though is the opportunity for Donald Trump to come in and make a correction make sure that uh, what the policy is between the US and Israel well I think uh, uh, by definition at noon on the 20th of January relations between the United States and Israel are going to improve dramatically the problem with the impact of this resolution and by the way other things that Obama may do between now and January the 20th uh, will be to disadvantage Israel because of the resolutions provision that basically authorizes and encourages nations and and uh, things like the European Union to impose their own national sanctions against Israel for uh, economic activity on the West Bank so this the harm that this resolution uh, is going to cause I think is going to be pervasive I do think there are things the United States should do to make the countries that supported it and the UN feel the consequences cutting off uh, financial contributions to the UN is one way to do it uh, but but this was a gratuitous act as you say you you think normally presidents go out gracefully I don't think Obama knows what that means uh, and that's why I say I remain worried perhaps beginning with what may come in this uh, speech that Secretary of State John Kerry will deliver tomorrow, perhaps in the French-sponsored peace conference in Paris that will begin of all dates on January the 15th, five days left in the Obama administration. I'm just worried the damage is not finished yet. Well, let's talk ab uh, about the UN itself because uh, uh, President George W. Bush, when he was talking about uh, all the resolutions that the UN had come up against Saddam Hussein and he said don't become irrelevant is the UN irrelevant well I think uh, it's gridlocked in its main political uh, entities like the Security Council and that's why I think this vote remember 14 to nothing with only the US abstaining even our best ally Britain countries like New Zealand uh, voting in favor of it. Uh, I just think that uh, really the, the UN as a whole only understands two things. One, the US veto, which Obama didn't use, and second, our money. Uh, where we've gotten the UN's attention before, it's when we've cut off contributions uh, or where we've threatened to do that. And uh, I think the incoming Trump administration has really got to take a strong stand here. It's got to, it's got to show people in New York this is not going to be business as usual. Would you recommend to President-elect Trump to cut off the funds? Well, I'd certainly recommend cutting off all of our assessed contributions to the main UN. That's about three billion annually. You know, in total, when you look at the entire UN system, all the specialized agencies, you look at assessed versus voluntary contributions, uh, it's about eight billion. I would go beyond that too. I think it's time to end the idea of assessed or mandatory contributions. I think all U.S. contributions across the entire system should be voluntary, and this is as good a pivot point to move to that as any I can think of. Yeah, it would be interesting. John Bolton, Ambassador uh, John Bolton, thank you so much. Good to see you. Thank you, Tom. You bet. Well, we're coming right back with much more, so stay with us. The incoming White House press secretary says President Trump will continue to tweet to America during his presidency. He has this direct pipeline in the American people where he can talk back and forth to almost 17 million people on Twitter. Doug Schoen and Lee Carter join us here next. And our lame duck president isn't leaving quietly. He claims he would have won a third term 
despite all of his failed policies and broken promises. We'll take that up, plus much more straight ahead. Stay with us. Now, President Obama is claiming he could have won a third term if he had been allowed to run. Well, during an interview with former senior advisor David Axelrod, Mr. Obama argued that Americans still subscribe to his vision of progressive change. I am confident in this vision because I'm confident that if I, uh, if I had run again and articulated it, I think I could have mobilized a majority of the American people to rally behind it. Well, isn't that interesting? He always talks about if he could just articulate it. Well, President-elect Trump says otherwise. Mr. Trump tweeting President Obama campaigned hard and personally in the very important swing states and lost. The voters wanted to make America great again. And an earlier tweet also hit the president, Trump writing, quote, President Obama said that he thinks he would have won against me. He should say that, but I say no way. Jobs leaving, ISIS, O'Care, et cetera. Well, joining me now, former Clinton pollster Doug Schoen and president of Melansky and Partners, Lee Carter. Uh, let me start with you, Mr. Schoen. Uh, yes, sir. What do you think about his thinking that he would have won a third term? Do you? Well, I mean, look, we'll never know, but uh, I think the election results were a repudiation of his policies to a large extent. A majority of the electorate said they wanted to go in a different direction and indeed did go in a different direction. He himself had said that Hillary would effectively provide a third term for the Obama administration and equally clearly the electorate rejected that notion. So I'm not entirely sure that the president of the United States is correct. Yeah, the idea, I think, uh, Lee, sounds like he really would like to have a third term. He's, <laughs> I think he's kind of would like to change that rule. I, I think he absolutely would. And I think that the, the big story here is not so much that he thinks that he could beat Donald Trump. It's what he's doing to Hillary Clinton. I mean, I think this is a big slap in the face to her. Um, when he was out there saying she's the most qualified candidate to ever run in the history of the world and that she is the right candidate at the right time, it makes everything seem like it wasn't genuine, it wasn't authentic, that he thought that he could do it better. And if he thought he could, I don't know why he didn't advise her. If he thought that he could articulate the progressive vision better, why didn't he help her? Did he really not want her to win? I just can't help but wonder what this is really all about. And, and, and Doug, you know, he's used that uh, phrase many times about the fact that, you know, well, I didn't explain it well enough. I didn't explain Obamacare well enough. I didn't explain whatever it might be. So he's back to that, if I, if I can articulate it. But at the same time, he was saying that she would be Hillary be a third term. Bill Clinton was saying Hillary would be a change agent. So it seemed like their messaging, which is your game, was all messed up. Yep. Well, I think you're right, Tom. I mean, I still don't know what Hillary's core message was other than stronger together. Uh, Donald Trump had clear messages. He had clear policies. And the Clinton campaign, as you yourself point out, in one level, it was going to do the same thing as Obama on another level going to be doing different things. And uh, other than, you know, progressive policies generally, I did not have a sense as to what would be her priorities. And the result was, while winning a popular vote victory, the Secretary of State lost a convincing electoral college uh, mandate for Donald Trump. This, um, the whole thing about this campaign and looking back at it and kind of analyzing it, uh, on one part, you look and you go, he's still popular. Uh, the Fox News poll still shows a better than 50 percent number in just about every category, which is pretty high for an outgoing president. But Dems have lost 1,042 state and federal Democratic posts during his tenure. So did he become popular but ruin the Democratic Party lead? Well, I think what's really interesting is if you ask most people if they feel they're better off today than they were at the beginning of the Obama presidency, most people say no. You can see certain areas, like you see the Silicon Valley and places in California, you see urban centers like city where there is growth, that people are going to say yes, and that's part of the reason the popular vote was different. But the rest of the country is hurting. And they're saying, you might say that you've had all this economic growth, you might say that you have all all of these great things that you keep saying, but that is not my truth. I need you to speak to my truth. I want a good paying job. I want hope for the future. 
And we've seen ever since Donald Trump has been elected, there's been a complete shift in optimism. The most recent poll said 55% of Americans since Donald Trump has been elected are are more optimistic mm -hmm. about what's going to be next year than they were for this year. And that's a big shift. So while the president currently does have a, a good approval rating, I think that there's a lot of people who are saying, I personally am hurting and I want to do better. So, Doug Schoen, if you were uh, advising Donald Trump, how long um, he's got to get going on delivering some goods? Now, he's done the carrier. He's talked to Boeing and Lockheed and some of those things. Mm -hmm. But um, when does he have to start delivering some jobs? Well... He, he's got to deliver a direction that will create jobs within the first hundred days or, frankly, as soon as possible. I think he's going to begin with an infrastructure uh, plan, hopefully one that gets bipartisan support. He's going to do tax reform, both uh, corporate and individual. And he's going to do uh, a, a tough immigration plan, including but not limited to building the wall. Maybe part of it will be a fence, but he's got to do that, and he's got to make it clear that that, along with repealing Obamacare, is his core agenda. Yeah, and, and so it, time is of the essence, I guess, when you take yeah, a look absolutely. at the fact. That's, that's probably why I guess we're all watching him uh, working pretty hard right now. So, listen, absolutely. Doug Chone, Lee Carter, both of you, thank you so much. Good Great to see to you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Well, malls across the country are increasing security after violence erupted at shopping centers in at least 12 states over the weekend. The disturbances included gunfire, massive brawls, and food court fights. And police say it may not have been spontaneous. Fox News correspondent Rob Schmidt has our report. It was mayhem the day after Christmas as fists flew at a mall in Fort Worth, Texas. The teenage brawl captured on cell phone video. Local police arrived after calls of gunfire, finding a number of fights instead. Officers seen here trying to jump in and stop this melee before anyone was seriously hurt. Malls all over the country looked like this yesterday, though there appears to be no connection. This video recorded near Cleveland, Ohio, shows more of the same. Teens all meeting at their local mall and a fight erupting. Pushing, shoving, punching, and running, sending shoppers fleeing for the exits. I seen the girl get trembled over. Like it, it was, it was scary. It was really scary for real. At this mall in Elizabeth, New Jersey, a chair crashing down on the floor sounded enough like gunfire to cause a panic. The small fight erupted, at which time someone slammed the chair down, causing a loud noise. Another patron yelled, "Shots fired!" or "Gun!" Uh, at that time. Pandemonium happened. Around eight people were hurt there. People screaming shots fired at a mall on New York's Long Island caused panic as well. The Fox Valley Mall in Aurora, Illinois was evacuated after fights broke out in a crowd of about a thousand people. A police sergeant was punched in the face. Eight juveniles have been charged. At least two of these fights may have been coordinated online, including this one in Aurora, Colorado, which happened at the Town Center Mall after around 500 teens met at the food court. Trying to take control, one police officer said he was surrounded by an unruly crowd, and that's when the decision was made to shut down and evacuate the mall. There were five arrests. No customers or officers were hurt. After receiving reports of possible flash mobs, police responded to two different malls in Memphis, Tennessee. Many shopping centers were packed yesterday, as many other stores were closed for the official weekday observance of Christmas. Tom? All right. Rob Smith, uh, thank you very much. Meantime, uh, violence raging in Chicago over the weekend. The Chicago Tribune reporting 61 people were shot in the city beginning Friday afternoon. Twelve others died from their wounds, bringing the total of murders up to 770 in Chicago. 56% increase from the 492 homicides last year. Chicago already has some of the strictest gun laws in the country. The city's police superintendent calling for even more restrictions. While this is the sickening reality, it shows yet again that our penalties for carrying and using guns here in Chicago are just not an effective deterrent against repeat gun offenders. While we have promising leads, this unacceptable level of violence demonstrates the clear and present need for policymakers to convene in January and give Chicago the gun sentencing tools against repeat gun offenders so that we can begin to change this narrative. Well, police are blaming most of the violence on gang conflicts, but whatever they're doing, it's, it's getting worse. 
We're coming right back with much more. Stay with us. The president-elect slams the biased media for its failure to report on his charity's generous work. The Donald J. Trump Foundation raised millions, so why can't the media call it straight? Randy Evans and Rachel Campos Duffy join me next. And this skier about to go for a ride in a winter wonderland, but with a dark twist. We'll show you the video of his incredible daring ride next. Stay with us. We're coming right back. Well, President-elect Donald Trump defending his foundation on Twitter last night and blasting the media, tweeting, quote, I gave millions of dollars to the DJT Foundation, raised or received millions more, all of which is given to charity, and media won't report it. Then he added, uh, the DJT Foundation, unlike most foundation, never paid fees, rent, salaries, or any expenses. 100% of the money goes to wonderful charities. Mr. Trump announced over the weekend that he will shut down the Trump Foundation to dispel concerns about conflicts of interest. But today, New York's leftist, and I mean really leftist, Attorney General Eric Schneiderman said the charitable foundation cannot legally dissolve until his investigation of whether Trump personally benefited from the foundation is complete. Well, joining me now, former senior advisor to the New Gingrich campaign, Randy Evans, and Fox News contributor Rachel Campos Duffy. Rachel, let's start with you. Eric Schneiderman uh, says, no, you can't shut it down. What, I mean, this is obviously a line of attack for Schneiderman, who is a hyper-partisan Democrat. Sure, it smells of partisanship, but if there is criminal activity, it needs to be investigated, and so it should remain open until they close that investigation. That said, listen, Donald Trump is right to close this down. Um, he needs to concentrate on the presidency. Right At this point in our nation's uh, uh, history, the best charity that Donald Trump can do is to bring back jobs and to get this economy started. So I hope it does get resolved and that they can close it down so he can concentrate on what the American people have hired him to do. Yeah, but Randy, I, I got a sneaking feeling that uh, Schneiderman's not going to let this thing go for as long as he can keep some sort of punching bag going. It gives him something to do keeps his name in the press, and Schneiderman, oh my gosh, he's, he, he sends out emails every day to the media about how wonderful he is. I'm not exaggerating. Well, I mean, this is a kind of political gamemanship that Donald Trump ran against. It's not surprising that the first thing he encounters is more political gamemanship. This is that old thing of heads I win, tails you lose. In other words, if Trump keeps it open, oh, he's now got conflicts of interest. If he tries to close it, he's trying to cut off an investigation. It was a no-win pr proposition. This is just political gamesmanship. But we've got to put an end to that kind of gamesmanship if we really want to start to solve problems. Well, I don't, I, I personally, I don't think this thing's going to end for a while. I think he's going to keep it going. I guess all Donald Trump, though, I mean, I, go back to this, Rachel. All he has to do is really just say, out of business, not accepting any more donations, not giving any more donations. Let the accountants and lawyers just kind sure. of work out the, the paperwork. It more, seems more technical sure. than anything else at this point. Sure. And listen, uh, Donald Trump has dealt with many lawsuits. Um, he, he knows he knows how to handle this this kind of stuff. And I tell you, he's smart to try and shut it down because he really needs he has a big job in front of him. Um, and and the, this guy looks like, you know, it, again, it looks like partisanship. Um, and and I think it will get exposed a, a, as being that the more he sort of pounds it out, especially, as you mentioned, as long as no money is coming in and they're not doing anything. Um, it looks like he's just uh, uh, investigating an empty shell. Yeah. Uh, Schneiderman is just trying to get his name out there, which he's doing a good job of. I think he wants to run for governor someday or something. He's got a political future. Listen, let me, uh, let's go on to uh, the visit at Pearl Harbor today between President Obama and the Prime Minister of Japan. Randy, um, what was your take on that? Well, I mean, I, I thought it was an important step. I mean, I thought it was great uh, to any time we're honoring troops who've served our country and died. And I thought it was great for the Japanese prime minister to come over to reassure and to establish a kind of close ties. But the thing that worried me the most was it wasn't what President Obama and the prime minister of Japan was doing. It's what President Obama has been saying, which is literally he's showing what happens whenever you're on the losing side. It's one thing to judge somebody when you're winning. Uh, it's a much different thing to look at what happens whenever you lose. And he's really been a sore loser in this last two or three weeks. Uh, and Rachel, I'm... I've got to admit, I don't know why, because everybody is praising the fact that uh, the prime minister of Japan was there. It just, 
It just bothers me. I don't know why. Does it you? <laughs> Uh, you know, it didn't bother me. I, I looked. I took this as a really great opportunity for me to sort of revisit this with my own kids. I have eight children. Um, many of our veterans uh, from that war are 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 are, are dead, are dying. Um, this is sort of a, a, a really interesting moment in history for us to be able to 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 revisit that with our children, teach them those lessons um, from that important war. And um, and again, I I didn't. I didn't take anything from that. All right. I think I'm the only one kind of walking around grumpy about it. <laughs> uh, Randy, let me ask you real You're quick before we, we run out of time, though. Third term uh -huh. for President Obama, would he, have, uh, would he have been able to do it? Well, I don't know. Could the Kansas City Royals have stopped the Chicago Cubs this year? They'd had another chance? No. Uh, he, he, it just shows how out of touch he is with the political realities of the day. He doesn't understand that his policies have been overwhelmingly repudiated by the American people. And until he accepts that, he's going to be kind of delusional thinking, oh, I could have won if I just, it's, it's all about me. If I could have been on the ballot, we would have won a third term. Just not true. Not, 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 where, the, uh, not where the American people are today. If he only could have articulated it better, that was his reason for it. <laughs> Randy Evans, Rachel Campos Duffy, uh, I hope we articulated this well. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. you. Well, be sure to vote in tonight's poll. Should the U.S. cut off the $3 billion that we give every year to the United Nations, especially after it voted to censure Israel? Cast your vote on Twitter, at Lou Dobbs. Well, as we reported earlier, President Obama believes the American people would have rallied behind his message if he had been able to seek a third term against Donald Trump. But over the past eight years, the American voter has been rejecting Mr. Obama and the left. Listen to this. Under President Obama, the Democratic Party has lost 63 House seats and 10 Senate seats. Republicans, meanwhile, have gained over 900 seats in state legislatures nationwide, along with 12 governorships, making two-thirds of the nation's governors Republican. Joining me now, National Spokesman for the Congress on Racial Equality, and conservative commentator Niger Ennis. <clears throat> Niger, listen, <laughs> you're already laughing. Listen, this, this, um, this is pretty shocking about how decimated the Democrats have become. I mean, I kind of blamed it on Hillary Clinton wasn't a good candidate, but it's obviously deeper when you start looking at all these numbers nationwide. And the thing is, it's not just on the federal level. Uh, as you said, it's on the state level with the number of state legislative seats that have gone Republican, the number of governorships uh, that are controlled by the Republican Party, I believe over 30, I think it's 33 to be exact. Um, it's been a real wipeout for the Democratic Party, and it is in weaker shape now than it has been since the Great Depression uh, in the 1920s. Uh, it, so, yeah. Is it is it the, the old... Remember, a lot of people forget that, that Barack Obama, when he was a senator, a lot of people said this is probably the most liberal guy running for office in a long, long time. He's not just a little bit left. He's way left. Is that what is it his fault that the Democrats have been so decimated his messaging? Well, you know, it's, it's a strange phenomenon because he's been able to uh, elect himself uh, in 2008, giving the image and projection that he was uh, middle of the road, and then in 2012, by demonizing Mitt Romney, he was able to get himself uh, reelected, which was pretty miraculous. But I think uh, the sweep that has taken place, the Republican sweep that has taken place over the last uh, eight years, is a reflection of a rejection by the American people of these far left policies. And I think that his center piece, uh, piece of legislation for his domestic agenda, which of course is Obamacare, is in real danger of being largely overturned. I mean, it's not going to be thrown out completely, uh, but it is more than likely uh, going to be dramatically changed uh, and, in a Trump administration with a Republican Congress. And, and things don't look uphill from, for a Democrat, because if you look at two years from now, one third of the Senate up for election, and the heavy majority of those are Democrat seats that have to be defended. 
and their Democrat states where Donald Trump either won or did extremely well. So their, the vulnerability continues. And I think the worst aspect of uh, the post-Obama years is the fact that the Democrat Party is not doing what is needed, which is its own self-autopsy, a real examination of the policies that they're making that are not striking a chord with the American people, and a desire to bring in you know, a, a younger, more vibrant bench that's more in tune with the American but, people. But uh, if you look at the leadership of the party in the uh, House of Representatives, I believe somebody did an uh, uh, adding up of the ages of, of all those uh, in the House of Representatives leadership, and it was like over 232 years. You know, that is not a reflection of a party that's doing a real self-examination and deciding to try to become a little bit more of a center-left party as opposed to far-left party, which yeah. is uh, currently the state of the party. The center-left was where Bill Clinton tried to sit and, and was very successful doing that. But to your point, did you hear what Harry Reid said about the... He says, if you look at the <laughs> My uh, leadership, it looks like an old folks' home. It's true. <laughs> That might be the one thing that I agree with with uh, my <laughs> senator or outgoing Senator Harry Reid. Yeah, I, but here's the other problem. I mean, what you talk about is the fact that they had a chance at getting a young guy, a uh, congressman from Ohio who was running against Nancy Pelosi. He, I don't know, 40 year old guy, something like that. He was yeah. he was the, right. young enough to be the sons of some of those leaders out there. And yet the Democrats in the House rejected him overwhelmingly. It wasn't just his age, but the uh, congressman from Ohio also represented the Rust Belt region of the country. He represented a lot of working class uh, Americans, whites in particular, but working class Americans across the board that the Democrat Party failed to attract in this election cycle. So he would have been a, a refreshing change, a hopeful change. You know, uh, folks like uh, I believe her name is Tulsi uh, out of Hawaii. Right. I mean, there are a number of more centrist oriented Democrats that are out there, but they're they're not coming into leadership and yeah. they're not being recognized by leadership. But, you know, if I, I just say, as we close the segment, one of the tragedies of the Obama years that is, is uh, left undone is the killing fields that uh, is taking place. It has been taking place over the last several years, but it's gotten particularly bad over the last couple of years, and that is in Chicago. You know, in one district in Chicago, the 11th district in Chicago, you had over 91 killings in 2016. That is more than most medium-sized cities. Yeah. That rate is up from 90 percent from a disastrous record-breaking murder rate of the year before. And whatever, that is a particular tragedy with this president that came into political office after being a community organizer. He had his man, his yeah. former chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, as mayor for the lion's share of his eight years in office. And yet he's leaving office with, uh, of course, he's he adopted the city of Chicago. That became his home city after leaving Hawaii. And the biggest tragedy, and I don't say this with, with, with partisan joy, I say this as a black man that feels uh, this is a real tragedy for the American people, that this killing field has not gotten better. In fact, it's gotten precipitously you're, worse you're not over alone. the last eight years. You're, you're not alone. Niger Ennis, great to, great to meet you. Nice to talk to you. Thank you, Niger. Happy New Year. Same to you. All right, up next, critics blasting the United Nations after it voted to censor Israel for settlement building. Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee says the whole U.N. headquarters in Manhattan must go. I think we ought to get jackhammers, and we ought to jackhammer the whole thing off, float it into the East River, ask anybody who would like to host it to come pick it up, haul it off, uh, and it'll be a lot easier to park in Manhattan after we get rid of it. <laughs> Parking solution. Leslie Marshall and Brad Blakeman, they weigh in on that and much more when we come back. Stay with us. Well, in our online poll last week, uh, we asked you, has President Obama embarrassed himself in the left by abstaining from the U.N. vote condemning Israel? 91% of you said yes, he has. So joining me now, radio talk show host, Fox News contributor Leslie Marshall. Hello, Leslie. And former member Hi. of President George W. Bush's senior staff, Brad Blakeman. Hello, Brad. So hey, how are you? what do you make of this abstaining thing? Why, why if the president, and by the way, Israel says that they're going to show Trump proof that President Obama was under, uh, behind this whole uh, resolution business. 
Why didn't they just vote for it instead of abstaining, Leslie? Well, honestly, I don't think this is a big surprise at all. I think that not only this administration, but other administrations in the past and largely Democratic administrations have been pushing for a two state solution, which the United States, obviously, by this vote, is not alone in the world with the idea that you have got to stop the settlements, which is a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, international law. And in addition to that, look, I've lived in Israel in 1996 when I lived there. It was problematic then. It is more so now. I understand people needing more places to live. I live in Los Angeles as far as space. But this is very problematic. It affects the economy. It uh, uh, certainly puts individuals at risk, and it does not get us any closer to peace, which most people believe a two-state solution is inevitable to be a part of. Yeah, but Brad, the, the Obama administration in the past has, has tried to act like they're a friend of Israel. And the key that Israel always points out is that the way to a two-nation, two two two-party state is to have negotiations.